join me in prayer. God, you have done such great things for all of us. Too many of us, too many for us to name them all. But we are so grateful to be here in your house with you this day. And we pray for everyone that's here that you bless them and help them to be the people that you've created us all to be. And for those who can't be here today, bless them as well. We live in such perilous times. And this week is especially important for all of us who live in this country to go out and and to cast our vote however we do that. And the one thing that you ask of us is that we do justice, love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. Help us to remember that that's your call to us in how we live our life every single day. And help us to be the people that you've created us to be in all that we do. Amen. Amen. The first reading this morning is from the book of Deuteronomy. And I've asked Rena to come up and to help me with this reading because this is um, the highest prayer that the Jewish people have. Um, it's, it's a reading that all of us who have mezuzahs at our house, this is the reading that's on, in the mezuzah that hangs on our door. And I thought that it, you just might like to hear a little bit of it in Hebrew. Now, I could do it, but you wouldn't get it at all. And if, <laughs> and if there was anyone in here who spoke Hebrew, they would know. <laughs> so Rena can do it. I'm going to read the first part, and then she's going to read the line in Hebrew that's the, the essential part of the prayer. And I just want to say thank you for inviting me to do this. I think especially in view of what's happened in our country, um, it's, it's wonderful that I can share this with you. Uh, unfortunately, I only know the first line in Hebrew. <laughs> I was going to tell her to keep going because nobody in here would probably know that we were saying something else. But, th- but this is uh, the foundational prayer, and that first line is the foundation of Judaism and I think of all religions. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord your God has charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one The Lord is our God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise up. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. as you're able for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. 
Come, Holy Spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O God. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given a good answer, he asked Jesus, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one, and there is no other but him to love. With all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, Jesus said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. This is the gospel of hope. Praise, Praise to you, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit.
Amen. Thank you very much. And will you pray with me, please? Holy and loving God, once more we want to say thank you for the very breath of life that you gave each and every one of us again this day, allowing us to rise once more, gather in this holy place, and seek your blessing upon us which is to know you in our lives a little bit better today and to know of your love for us a little bit better today. And so we ask that you speak into our hearts now, dear Lord, for we are listening. Amen. 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 You know, I began thinking this past week, doesn't it just feel great when somebody just simply agrees with you (laughs) without having to argue or get upset with one another or throw your hands up in the air totally dismayed that somebody could hold a view so different from yours which of course makes them wrong, right? (laughs) Which, And all that much more frustrating that that is not as obvious to them as it is to you. So again, isn't it just so much easier when people simply agree with you? I mean, my goodness, think of it. How all the ills of the world could be healed in one instant if people would just agree. Or how about, remember, remember when we used to say that, that we could um, agree to disagree? I don't think we say that much anymore. Whatever happened to that? You know, remember when we could disagree with someone, even wholeheartedly, but still think they were a decent person? Wrong, of course, but decent. <laughs> well, unfortunately, I think we now live in a society and a time and a world that has become so fractured and so disagreeable that it is, it is easier to discount someone else's humanity rather than simply disagree with them. And that is sad. Yes. And what makes it even more sad is that, is that something new, I think, is occurring in our disagreements. I mean, throughout history, people have, of course, disagreed and have even been at each other's throats. Ever since the firstborn son of humanity, Cain, murdered his own brother Abel, right? That part's not new. What is new is our technology and the speed, often only milliseconds, that information can travel around the world and our almost unlimited access to anything and everything that is being said by anyone and everyone. And then add to that the relative anonymity of being able to, you know, pound out your disagreement, send anger, hit send, knowing that there's really little chance of someone holding us responsible or suffering any real consequences that our words might incite. That is what is different than, say, the days of you know, marathon runners between towns in ancient Greece who had to carry what, a message from one place to another, or you know, war runners in wars that had to run through battlefields and carry messages from one general to another. And it took time for that to happen. You know, and then letters that had to be carried across the country in either a Wells Fargo covered wagon or had to go across the Atlantic on a ship. And as history went on, of course, and we got telegrams, which were much faster, telephones, of course. But think about it. You know, it was only like 23 years ago, I say that because it was 1995 that AOL was introduced to the world. (laughs) that the internet became so prevalent and our modern day abundance of instant communications became indispensable to our way of life. 
And of course, all this advance in technology was supposed to harbor a, a, a new golden age of communication, right? And of course, it has in many ways. I mean, remember when we actually had to wait for something to arrive in the mail? Or sit grinding our teeth trying to be patient? while listening to our modems try to connect to AOL or Prodigy <laughs> before we could send something over this magical new email. And Lord forbid if you attach a photo to it, it'd be like downloading, 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 and then drop halfway through. Back in the day when we paid by the minute, anybody else ever get like $300 AOL bills? And you're like, well, how did that happen? How great the annoyances of the yesteryear of our lives, huh? Well, now, not anymore. You know, now we can send and receive anything we want from our desktops, laptops, handheld devices, telephones, of course. I mean, even our refrigerators now can deliver all the news and information we could ever desire. But what if you do not desire that? What if you do not want to be constantly bombarded with every bit of information every single second of every single day. Would life be so bad? I mean, whether it's news or fact or opinion or, of course, now fake, you know, real rebuttal argument, whatever it is. I mean, why is it that so many people now feel the need to be that plugged in to that many outlets? I mean, eventually, we're just going to overload and explode. Again, just think back to a few years ago when we only had that one outlet on the entire wall and everything had to be plugged into it <laughs> until eventually sparks would fly, fuses would blow, and the whole house would go dark. Well, I'm afraid that is what is happening to our whole world right now. Sparks are flying and the whole thing could blow at any time. But I think we can step back from this particular brink. And I know we can. For just as much as I see good people, friends, quickly moving from a polite discussion about anything to full-blown shouting matches, I also see people choosing not to engage at that level. Now, I'm not suggesting at all that we ignore critical issues in the world and refuse to discuss them. No. Nor am I suggesting that we throw away our convictions for the sake of something called peace. Because if we do that, that's not real peace, is it? For real peace takes the participation of, of all parties, not the victory or defeat of one over the other. So what do we do? What can we do in a world that wants to shout at us and divide us and, and inflict suffering on so many people? Well, we seek and engage a different path. One that is rooted in love. Buttressed by our own convictions, of course, but ultimately rooted in love. And seeking the path of love, you know, that's not something to be quibbled at or to be thought of as, as the weak position to take or defeatist in today's antagonistic world. For I will never agree that the aggressor is the victor in life. Let us look at the events that occurred in Pittsburgh last week. Where was the victory there? Was it with the one who killed 11 people? or the stories that quickly surfaced about Jewish nurses and doctors who chose to treat that person knowing what he had done. Or 
was the victory in the outpouring of solidarity by people of all kinds of different faiths and backgrounds and beliefs and whatever else in life. The victory, of course, was not found in the suffering. The victory was found in the love. The violent anger did not win. Love won and continues to win. For there are actually more people in this world who are somehow able to keep their cool rather than go on murderous rampages. Right. Doesn't seem that way. There are way too many. But obviously it's true. We don't have 320 million murderous rampages every week. We have way too many. So yeah, I began to wonder, how is that? How do the majority of people actually manage to keep their cool? Even in the most disagreeable and upsetting of circumstances. And of course, I often wonder how Jesus was able to keep his cool in his lifetime. For when you think about it, people, and mostly people back then who had positions of power, were always trying to trick him up, to get him to say things on the record that they could use against him later. They were always arguing points of religion, hoping they could catch him in some heresy where they actually had the power because of their being in cahoots with a foreign occupying army. They actually had the power, if they caught him in one of these things, to arrest him, have him tried in a court, and eventually killed. So anyway, today's story... Today's story is very interesting. It starts by saying one of the scribes, meaning one of the people who kept track of laws and things with with religion, one of the scribes was poking around and, and heard others disputing things with Jesus. Now, quick review. You know, whenever we read a a gospel story, especially, and we we jump in the middle of one, it's always good to go back a little bit and see where in context are we. Because it says that people were were arguing with Jesus, and they were. And, of course, today's story is part of a much longer story. We just got a a little bit of it. But the largest story is Jesus has been arguing with these people for days now, you know, foes that had been trying very hard to get him to lose his cool and say something or do something for which they could hang him out to dry. And so they they were asking him things about taxes. Should we pay them? How much should we pay? They asked him, uh, what about marriage and divorce? What do you think about that? And religion? What do you think about that? And who was right and who was wrong on all all these things? Does any of this sound familiar? (laughs) It hasn't changed that much. Well, Jesus, of course, does not fall into their traps and actually ends up silencing most of his opponents because his answers very effectively point out that these people had no intention of trying to find a good answer to their question. They were really just trying to bring Jesus down. So into that into this very contentious environment where they're just going at them. We have today's story with Jesus being poked at once again, someone else trying to push his buttons to get him all riled up so, so that he says something that they can hang him with. Except this time, something unusual happens. It says... Someone agrees with him. I mean, think about it. After all that arguing and specific attempts to entrap Jesus, knowing that if they ever could do so, that they could have him killed, that suddenly one of these people agrees with Jesus? I mean, why? Why would anyone do that? Does that happen very often today? I mean, why would this person who previously had been working, working every angle they could to trap Jesus, 
I mean, what possibly could have motivated this person to suddenly agree with him and say, you're right, good answer? Well, to put it simply, it was love. The law of love. That says, the Lord God is one, and that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul. This was a law that not even the pundits of the day could refute or ignore. And so in that one second of this ongoing battle between people, the law of love broke through so that even this dastardly scribe, as he's described, who was not an evil person, just dastardly in this case, that even this dastardly person had to acknowledge the supremacy of this particular law and command. And the climax of this story, Jesus adds to this ancient law, saying that in addition to loving God with all your heart, mind, and soul, so must you love your neighbor as yourself, and that nothing is greater than this. (coughs) Well, my friends, as I have mentioned on numerous occasions, I am under no illusion that what I may say on any particular day, particularly Sunday, is going to suddenly heal the world. What I do expect, what I hope for, I should say, is that you may find enough healing here this morning that you, we, and then us, can go out and help heal the world one day, one person, one disagreement at a time. And when you feel depleted, simply come back next week, and we'll do it all over again. For the world can certainly tangle us up, but it is the quiet, yet powerful love of God that can set us free. One final thought, which I have to admit, I don't think I've ever paid too much attention to before. That when Jesus says we must love our neighbor, he says that we must love them as we love ourselves. I think that a lot of what we witness on a daily basis as anger toward others is, at least in part, an internalized anger at ourselves for not being able to heal the world's wounds instantly. For most of us are fixers. Most of us do really want to care for others and not harm them. And when we cannot fix a situation or a person, we feel frustrated. And frustration on the inside often leads to anger on the outside and depression and apathy and just an overall sense of detachment that I don't want to participate in this anymore. So I am actually going to ask you to do something this week, and that is to pay attention to loving yourself just as much as you would love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Because that love of self must be just as real as our love for God and our love for others for this whole thing to work. Okay? Amen? Amen. 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 Will you pray with me, please? Holy God, guide us in this world in peaceful ways. 
Mend hearts that are broken today. Soften hearts that are hardening today. In this time of great expectation in our land, whether it be fearful, joyful, or apathetic to it all, make your spirit known in a world that has trouble believing in your spirit. God, I ask that in this community, this community that, community that begins here at St. Jude's but extends out as ripples upon a pond, I ask that you embolden us so that we may stand tall as your beloved children, allowing others to see your grace and love at work within us. Lord, in our daily lives, we do not know what the future holds. Let us look to you to lead us home and to lead others into your loving presence. Bless us and keep us strong under the banner of your holy name. Amen. Amen. And now, my friends, let us take a moment of silence and allow this embracing love of God to fill us today. the love that God has given to me. I hope this song will be a blessing to you. There's a lighthouse on the hillside that overlooks life's sea when I'm tossed it sends out a light that I might see and the light that shines in the darkness now will say It wasn't for the lighthouse, my ship would be no more, and I thank God for the lighthouse, I owe my life to Him, for Jesus is the lighthouse. They don't sail this way anymore. There's no use of it standing around. But then my mind goes back to that storm in night when just in time I saw that light 
And if it wasn't for that lighthouse, it still stands there on the hill. And I thank God for the lighthouse. I owe my life to Him. For Jesus is the lighthouse. And from the rocks of sin, He has shown the light. what you're going through today, but listen to that second verse again. Everybody that lives around us says tear that lighthouse down. The big ships, they don't sail this way anymore. Well, there's no use in that lighthouse standing round. Oh, but then my mind goes back to one stormy night when just in time I saw the light. Yes, the light from that old lighthouse. Thank God it still stands on the hill. And I thank And join me, please, in saying together our prayer of the people. Holy God, you have set your path before us. Yet we wander on our own until we hear your voice calling us again. Help us to remain close to you and rest in your presence. Holy God, help us to see you every day, relying on your guidance as we journey in faith. Amen. And may the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right to give God thanks and praise. So let us join with that heavenly choir of angels in that unending hymn of praise, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Well, 
blessed is the one who came down to earth so that we all may know the wonder of God's love. So with thanks and praise, let us proclaim again what is the mysterious and miraculous truth of our faith, that Christ, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ is here, and Christ shall come again. And now let us all pray together in the words that Jesus gave <coughs> us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In memory of Christ's death and resurrection, we offer to you, O God, this life-giving bread and this saving cup. We ask that you turn these simple elements of your creation into our spiritual nourishment once more, so that we may be filled with an understanding of your grace and love, that we may then go out and share with a very hungry and hurting world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. My friends, here at St. Jude's, as in every single MCC church around the entire world, we celebrate an open communion table, which at its very simplest means, you do not need to be a member of this church or any church anywhere to come and receive these gifts now blessed by God for all of God's people. We offer communion by placing the wafer into your mouth. You may come by yourself or with friends and loved ones. And then we offer a small prayer after that with you. If you prefer to just receive the elements and return to your seat for your own private prayer, that the station farthest over by the organ will do that for you. However you come to this table, however, we ask that you do come and come just as you are. Come just as you are. and see 
friends, please do come receive these gifts of God for all of God's children.
holy and loving God, once more we say thank you for bringing us into your presence again this day and blessing us anew, to which we all can say thank you and amen. Amen. And now if you would help me sing our closing song, we're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4. 1, 2, and 4 of number 147 in our hymnal. Again, this day, 
Go knowing of God's love for you and share some love with someone you meet this week. Amen. Amen. Amen.